<laughs> Good afternoon. First of all, it is absolutely wonderful and a joy to see you all here this afternoon. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Rosa Solorio. I serve as Associate Dean for International and Comparative Legal Studies here at GW Law School. And I give you the most warm welcome to this event in which we're going to be examining issues related to democracy and its very important connection to human rights in the Americas. And I actually want to welcome particularly Ambassador Francisco Mora, who's here. You know, thank you so much for all of the work that you, you know, and your mission is doing to advance this issue in, at the level of the OAS. And thank you also for giving us the opportunity to host um, this very important dialogue today. And I just want to say that um, there's a few things that we're going to be discussing today. And it gives me a lot of uh, joy to be able to do it, especially in this setting, because for us at the International Law Program at UW Law School, we really want our program to convene critical actors to discuss issues that have not only theoretical implications, but also practical implications in different countries of the world. We have a very close relationship you know, with the Organization of American States, and it's really wonderful to be able to host you know, this kind of space and this kind of dialogue in which we have representation from different sectors to discuss very important issues related to the follow-up of the Inter-American Democratic Charter at the level of the OAS and this voluntary group that has been formed that Ambassador Mora will be discussing um, shortly. And I just wanted to say that we're gonna be discussing not only human rights challenges and how they impact democratic governance, but also very important connected issues. We're gonna be discussing discrimination today. We're also gonna be discussing environmental issues and climate change. Um, and we're also going to be discussing what we can do you know, at the level of the Organization of American States and also what can be done by governments, by civil society organizations and all the critical actors that are involved in these issues. And I just wanna say that I'm also very, very happy to be joined today by a very distinguished group of speakers and panelists. And I wanna introduce them. This is by alphabetical order because they're all incredibly important and I'm very happy you know, that they're here to share the work that they're doing in these areas. One of them is Liliana Avila. She's actually gonna give some remarks via Zoom. She's the coordinator of the Human Rights and Environmental Program of the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, AIDA. And she specializes in constitutional law and has great experience in international human rights law and human rights protection systems. We also have a message from Javier Palumo, who's currently serving as the Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. He has very lengthy experience in human rights, public management, public policies for social development, and children's and women's rights issues. And then we have Professor Dinah Shelton. I don't think she needs an introduction. For us, she's kind of like an icon. She's kind of like a legend. I'm extremely happy that she's here with us today. And I just want to say, you know, that she's the Mana Professor of International Law Emeritus here at GW Law School and an author of multiple award-winning books and articles on international law and human rights. And she's also a globally known scholar in these areas as well as in the environment and regional human rights protection systems. And she also served as commissioner and president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And we also have Joaquin Vallejo, who I believe is here. And he's the Deputy Director for Democracy, Governance, and Human Rights at the Pan American Development Foundation. He has 10 years of experience managing international development projects on issues such as transparency and extractive industries, judicial independence and accountability, and human rights in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I just wanted to say that many of the speaker remarks today will center around three questions in particular. One of them is that connection between democracy and the advancement of human rights and how the Inter-American Democratic Charter can be a key instrument in addressing challenges uh, related to democratic governance and how they impact human rights. But we're also gonna be discussing best practices, strategies, and challenges in addressing discrimination and 
and its impact on democratic governance in the Americas, especially problems of great relevance today that have a lot of not only regional coverage, but also international coverage, like environmental concerns and climate change. And lastly, we're going to be discussing suggestions, you know, suggestions on, on and recommendations on how to best address human rights challenges to democratic governance in the context of the voluntary group and the work of the OAS as follow-up to the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And I actually want to thank a few people, you know, to make that, that really made this event possible. Ambassador Mora, of course, Andrew Stevenson, who's here, Andrea Alarcón, Maria Teresa Mellencamp, Elinor Ketelon, Carlos Casanova, Rodrigo Subieta, and others that are here with us today. And also our team here at GW Law School. We have Leah Calabro, Jean C. Dye, Dorothy Anderson, and Selena Davis, who have, all, who have all worked tirelessly to make sure we have this event today. I also want to highlight that we have lunch available. So please help yourselves You know while we're having this discussion. Um, and it's wonderful that you're here with us today. And I really thank you. And before we actually start our, our, our panel of speakers, I wanted to give the microphone to uh, Ambassador Moore. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Rosa. And, and, and thank you most of all for a, a wonderful job you've done in um, organizing this event and working with with the voluntary group and with the OAS secretariat to, to, to make it another sort of input that we, um, we are having at the voluntary group as part of our discussions um, that we've had now for, for a couple of months. Um, I just want to take just a few minutes uh, to talk a little bit about the voluntary group for those of you who are here and that are participating but maybe don't know some of the of the, of the context, uh, I currently chair, uh, chair the voluntary group, uh, known as the voluntary group for the follow-up of the Inter-American Charter. Um, and it was, um, uh, I think as many of you know, um, is composed of about 19, or is composed of 19 member states. And it's open to participation by, of course, all member, member states, and it was created in response to uh, a mandate resolution titled Strengthening Democracy uh, at the June 2023 uh, OAS General Assembly that was held la um, here in Washington, D.C. last year. And its purpose, its aim, is to promote uh, dialogue, horizontal cooperation, uh, and exchange of good practices, as well as to identify opportunities within the principles of, of the OAS Charter and of the Inter-American Democratic Charter to strengthen democracies in the Americas. I think as uh, many of you know, I think it is a critical time at, in which um, all the polling data suggests that support for confidence in democracy is not what it was just five, 10 years ago today. And it's being reflected in many ways in the region. The group's uh, work plan um, consists of four elements, or as we call them, four axes, uh, consistent with the chapters of uh, the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And today's event is in the spirit of supporting the first axis, uh, titled Democracy and Human Rights. Um, a pair that, as the charter reads, is universal, indivisible, and interdependent. Uh, as I said, we're proud to be chairing the voluntary group alongside the delegation of Peru, who's serving as vice chair, and to have the opportunity to engage civil society. Uh, and of course, to engage with the George Washington University to address the linkages between governance and human rights challenges and the contemporary problems which impact democratic governance, such as environmental degradation and climate emergency. Tipping my hat to Rose's recent published book. Uh, I'm pleased here uh, today to have, as Rosa explained, really a distinguished group of individuals, experts, panelists, who will be providing further input to our own internal discussions within the voluntary group. I will not introduce them. Uh, Rosa has done that already. Uh, but I do look forward to uh, a discussion on contemporary problems, strategies that we may use to tackle them, 
and the main points of connection between democracy <clears throat> and the advancement of human rights in the Americas. Keeping in mind the democratic charter as the framework that we're using for our own internal uh, discussion. So I hope our discussion today can help continue informing our thinking on the part of OAS member states, especially as we look forward to the uh, forthcoming OAS General Assembly in June uh, held in Paraguay. So with that, uh, Rosa, let me turn it back over to you uh, for the discussion. And once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ambassador Mora. And we will begin with some remarks from Liliana Avila, who's actually joining us via Zoom. Hi, everyone. Hello. Can I start? Yes, yes, please. You can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to share also the table with the ambassador and with Dina Shelton, which is well known for all of the, the, uh, her contribution to the environmental protection in the Americas. Um, well, I want to focus my presentation on the link between democracy and environmental protection. Uh, because basically, we as a humanity are fa we are facing a triple planetary uh, planetary crisis, and this crisis threatens the well-being and survival of millions of people around the world, and refers to three interrelated problems: climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And each of these problems is a crisis with its own causes and effects, but all three converge and feed on each other. And most important, uh, all three affect human rights and more intensely impact people in vulnerable conditions. And the planetary crisis is addressing at the same time a democratic, uh, and, um, a democratic uh, governance challenge. And this challenge can be characterized by, in many ways, but I just want to mention some elements to show how this crisis uh, can also affect democracy governing, governance in our region. Um, just to start, uh, I'm just going uh, uh, to present uh, three elements. Uh, environmental and climate impacts cross borders. One example is the Amazon, the world's largest tropical forest, is the home of 10% of the planet biodiversity and is the ancestral home of more than 470 indigenous and traditional people. And the Amazon is a shared ecosystem but not states in the region and is facing many problems due to deforestation, trust events, and the Amazon protection is a regional issue but also Democracy and rule of law are key to other solutions to protect them. Uh, also, I want to mention something, some, some elements that are really, really relevant, uh, and it is about climate, uh, climate migration. Climate change is emerging as a potential driver of migration, and the migration for Central America, for example, in the dry corridor, due to causes associated to climate change is also a regional uh, problem. People from Central America and leaving their countries moving mainly to the north and facing a humanitarian crisis that involve all the, the, the rights and increase the poverty. And climate migration could add up at a high of 70 point million by 2050, according to the World Bank. And last but not least, um, I want to talk about the environmental conflicts in our region. In recent region, in, in recent re uh, years throughout the region, there has been an evident expression of conflict centered on environmental environmental issues, in a in a variety form. Uh, but uh, the claims were mixed with deep social, ethnic, and economical marginalizations. By 2070, the Atlas of Environmental Justice record, recorded more than 
587 conflicts in Latin America, representing basically the 32 of the total of social environmental conflicts wide world. Uh, this, the, I mean, these challenges could be really scary, but scientists and international community have already defined some, some, some actions to, to, to confront this challenge, but limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, accelerating the, the expansion of clean renewable energy, investing in attention and, and, attention and resilience, conserving and protecting the 30% of the planet, improving the food systems. And all of them are really important, but uh, the one that is most, most important uh, is not leaving, no, I mean, is leaving no one behind. I mean, the measures must be carried out simultaneously, of course, but with a focus on a protecting of human rights as they represent an opportunity to reduce the inequalities that are both a cause and also a consequence of the crisis and have a great impact on democracy. Uh, but the most important is that Inter-American Democratic Charter has already some answers to this to, to, to face this challenge. Uh, firstly, uh, the chapter already recognized that a safe environmental is essential to the integral development of the human beings, uh, which contributes to democracy and political stability. And also recognize that transparency in governmental activities, respect for social rights, freedom of expressions, participation in decisions related to their uh, to the development for all the citizens are essential components for the exercise of democracy. And also there are essential to guarantee the environmental protection. And finally, the chapter, the chapter also remarks the importance of stretching the inter-American system for protection of the human rights, uh, for the consolidation of democracy in, in, in our region. And this is really key, uh, in my perspective, strengthen the inter-American system, promote the mandate of the special reporter of economic, social, and cultural rights to promote the climate, the climate and inverted to promote climate and environmental justice in the region are, are vital. The inter-American system must be strengthened to promote the protection of the Amazon and the people who depend on it, to protect the rights of migration, and to guarantee that they don't, they don't be forced to leave their countries because of poverty, to prevent environmental conflicts from expanding and affecting democratic governance, and also to help the state to accelerate all the measures needed to confront the crisis and leaving leave, leave no one behind. Uh, this is my first um, I mean, presentation. I'm really happy to, to be here and to hear from the all, the, the all, all other speakers and, and the public for, for more inputs. Thank you so much. Liliana, thank you so much for connecting remotely and really giving us very insightful remarks on the connections between democracy and environmental protection and the triple planetary crisis and a lot of the governance issues that we're having today. Now we're gonna move on to Javier Palumo, who's actually, who very kindly recorded a message for this event. So we're just gonna hear the message. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas, soy Javier Palumo, es un gusto para mí en mi calidad de relator especial sobre derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos participar en estos simposios entre la OEA y la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad George Washington. En este caso eh, vamos a abordar algunos aspectos vinculados a la gobernanza democrática, desafíos de los derechos humanos igualdad, no discriminación y medio ambiente, enmarcando esta exposición en el plan de trabajo de la Redesca para el periodo de mi mandato 2024-2026. Quiero saludar inicialmente al embajador Mora por su iniciativa en su calidad de presidente del Grupo Voluntario de Estados Miembros de la OEA para promover el diálogo, la cooperación y el intercambio de mejores prácticas en el fomento de democracias sólidas en las Américas. También a Rosa Celorio, decana asociada y profesora de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de George Washington, así como a quienes me acompañan en este panel y al público presente. 
En la región, la interrelación entre los derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales y el fortalecimiento democrático es crucial. El protocolo de San Salvador y la Carta Democrática Interamericana resaltan la democracia como esencial para el progreso socioeconómico de la región, instando a una profundización de la misma que vaya de la mano con el desarrollo integral y una lucha efectiva contra la pobreza. Los episodios recurrentes de inestabilidad democrática, la emergencia de regímenes autoritarios y las protestas por la exigencia de DESCA, de derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales, evidencian la necesidad de una democracia sólida y garantice estos derechos. Las crisis del costo de vida, por ejemplo, impulsada por la inflación en la región, que ha exacerbado la desigualdad y ha aumentado el descontento, ha generado profusas protestas en muchos países de la región. La exclusión social, el racismo sistémico, la vulneración de los derechos laborales y sindicales, así como del derecho a la salud y la corrupción, representan desafíos significativos. En América Latina, aproximadamente un tercio de la población vive en la pobreza y más de la décima parte en la pobreza extrema, lo que destaca la magnitud de la exclusión social. La desigualdad de ingresos es notable, con más de la mitad del ingreso total de la región que se va al 20% más rico de la población. Este contexto de pobreza y desigualdad afecta desproporcionadamente a mujeres, niños, niñas, pueblos indígenas, exacerbando problemas de exclusión social de larga, larga data. El racismo es un problema significativo, especialmente en cuanto a derechos laborales de estas poblaciones. Por ejemplo, se reporta una persistente desigualdad racial en el mercado laboral. Las personas afrodescendientes en América Latina son 2.5 veces más propensas a vivir en condiciones de pobreza crónica y enfrentan peores resultados educativos y mayores tasas de desempleo en comparación con sus pares no afrodescendientes, incluso con el mismo nivel de educación y experiencia. Este tipo de situaciones subrayan la urgente necesidad de democracias sólidas que protejan los derechos humanos y enfrenten los desafíos de la exclusión social, el racismo sistémico y otros problemas señalados. La consolidación de regímenes autoritarios y el declive democrático en algunas naciones resaltan la importancia de reforzar las instituciones democráticas y promover una gobernanza inclusiva y transparente. Este entorno de racismo, sexismo, desigualdad, no solo afecta la calidad de vida de las personas, sino que también socava la gobernabilidad y la estabilidad política en la región, creando un círculo vicioso de pobreza y exclusión que es difícil de sin un compromiso político y social serio y sostenido para abordar estas desigualdades profundamente arraigadas. La degradación ambiental también es y debe ser una preocupación crítica, particularmente en la región de América Latina y el Caribe, que alberga algunos de los ecosistemas más diversos y vulnerables del mundo. Las políticas de protección ambiental, la gestión sostenible de los recursos naturales y la lucha contra el cambio climático son esenciales para preservar estos recursos para las generaciones futuras. La participación ciudadana en la toma de decisiones ambientales es un aspecto crucial. Las consecuencias ambientales del cambio climático impactan en forma desproporcionada a comunidades pobres, quienes viven en favelas y otros territorios periféricos. Las mujeres, las personas afrodescendientes y los pueblos indígenas, entre otros grupos que han sido histórica y estructuralmente discriminados. La democracia juega un papel crucial al facilitar la participación ciudadana en la toma de decisiones ambientales, garantizando que las voces de estos grupos más afectados sean escuchadas y consideradas. Es crucial promover la participación equitativa de las mujeres en los procesos políticos y de toma de decisiones, así como reconocer el papel esencial de las personas defensoras del medio ambiente y de las comunidades en la lucha contra las amenazas climáticas. Una democracia robusta se sustenta en instituciones democráticas fuertes, derechos y libertades garantizadas, y una cultura política basada en el diálogo y en la tolerancia. 
donde se aseguren condiciones básicas de vida que permitan el ejercicio completo de la ciudadanía y la participación en los procesos de toma de decisiones. Los gobiernos de la región deben abordar las preocupaciones crónicas sobre los derechos humanos, incluida la pobreza, la desigualdad, la corrupción, la inseguridad y la degradación ambiental, protegiendo al mismo tiempo la democracia. Por ello, la Redesca, con su nuevo plan de trabajo para el periodo 2024-2026, recientemente aprobado en forma unánime por la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, enfatiza la interconexión entre democracia y derechos humanos para fomentar el progreso colectivo, apuntando a empoderar poblaciones discriminadas y excluidas en la defensa de sus derechos. Y además prioriza la libertad académica y artística, esenciales para una democracia vibrante, alentando el diálogo crítico y la expresión creativa. Este plan se presenta como una herramienta clave para coordinar esfuerzos, desarrollada mediante consultas con actores regionales claves, incluyendo a los estados de la OEA, estados observadores, instituciones nacionales de derechos humanos, organizaciones de la sociedad civil y personas expertas. Para culminar mi exposición, en mi calidad de relator especial, quiero subrayar la importancia de que las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, la academia y sobre todo los estados se apropien de este plan de trabajo y contribuyan activamente para lograr su implementación. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas. I just want to thank Javier Palumo for his presentation and just wanted to say that he really highlighted very important components of his work plan that has been approved by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And his work plan emphasizes that connection between economic, social, and cultural rights and also environmental rights and also strong democracies. And he made a very important connection you know, between strong democracies and also the specific needs of groups that we know are at risk uh, of human rights violations in our hemisphere, including women and indigenous peoples and others, and really highlighted the need for these groups to have an active participation in any policies related to strengthening democracies, but also the advancement on human rights. So we're very grateful to Javier for having recorded this video. And now I turn the floor to Professor Dinah Shelton for her remarks. Thank you very much, Rosa. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about the intersections, the interconnectedness of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law all of which form the pieces of the quest, which is as old as the earliest written texts we have for justice, how to establish and ascertain the institutions and processes necessary to achieve a society that is just for all its members. Um, <clears throat> Rulers and philosophers throughout history have um, sought to define what is necessary to achieve this just society, and the quest has never ended. People throughout the world continue to insist on obtaining a freely chosen government operating under the rule of law. But elections are not the ultimate goal, however, but they are an essential part of the institutional structure that attempts to achieve, in the words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, freedom, justice, and peace in the world based on the um, inalienable and equal rights of all. Um, <clears throat> we see here the essential notions of human dignity, equality, freedom, and protection of the rule of law. They foster the conditions necessary for the self-actualization and self-determination of each person consistent with the rights of others, a process that makes life meaningful and contributes to the development of each society. History as well as current events did demonstrate that elections and democratic rule must be tempered by respect for the rights of those in the minority, 
lest democracy itself becomes an instrument of oppression. We've seen in the past how <clears throat> in laws that codified slavery and discrimination against minorities and particularly people of color, um, there remains much to be done to ensure that majority rules do not become the means of repressing disfavored opinion, opinions, groups, or individuals. For this, it is important to place human rights at the level of const in the constitutional hierarchy above ordinary laws and ensure that these rights are respected and ensured in institutions operating under the rule of law. Just as democracy without limits can oppress, the insistence on rights without limitations can create conditions of injustice and even anarchy. The generally recognized principle of abusive right is an acknowledgement that each person's rights must be balanced by respect for the rights and freedoms of other and the just requirements of the general welfare in a democratic society. The unlimited assertion by each person of absolute rights is a recipe for anarchy and dominance by the most powerful. It is through the democratic process that the majority exercises its judgment about the general welfare, while independent judicial bodies apply the rule of law to determine whether the majority's judgment has erred in being arbitrary or disproportionate, resulting in denial or infringement of the rights of some. Thus, the third prong that is necessary to promote a just society is the rule of law. Law provides the framework under which democratic institutions operate, giving them legitimacy and law tempers the democratic rule by in ensuring respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms of all. A claimed rule of law that is neither democratic nor respective of human rights constitutes a dictatorship. The rule of law provides equal justice, that, but also it encompasses the principle of equity that allow for exceptional adjustments or correctives to fulfill the underlying and overarching societal purposes for which laws are adopted. Like history are treated alike, and dissimilar situations are treated in ways to take account of relevant differences. The question is always what constitutes a relevant difference. What formal equality that imposes equal obligations of, on those that are unequal in re relevant ways creates an injustice if it exacerbates inequalities or imposes unfair burdens on those least able to bear them. The rule of law thus can seek substantive equality by taking into account that relevant dissimilarities warrant a just of adjustment or equal treatment. Many institutions play uh, essential roles in this quest for ju justice society. Laws and uh, legislators are the essence of the democratic process, serving at the will of the people and expressing the values and goals of the nation. In the process, in their functions, they help create but are also bound by the rule of law. As such, the laws they initiate and enact must always be mindful of human rights and fundamental freedoms of all persons within the society, as well as the constitutional framework of the state's international obligations. This is also true of executive officials whose motto is, quote, to faithfully execute the laws. The tension between majority rule and minority rights lays out in the relations between the state and the individual. These relations are complex because in some areas of governance, 
the state must abstain from actions that impact the individual and refrain from interfering with the exercise and enjoyment's rights. On other matters, however, the states must affirmatively act affirmatively to promote and ensure the fulfillment of rights, especially when it comes to basic needs. Care must be taken because the exercise of government of government creates power, which may be abused unless restrained. But the failure of government to act allows the concentra concentration of power in the hands of the non-state actors, where it also may be abused. The judiciary has a critical role in preserving the rule of law, the enactments of the majority, and the rights of the minority. The rule of law that requires that all institutions act within the law and none have unlimited or unchecked power. The functioning of an independent and impartial legal system is essential. As such, courts must apply the law and enforce the rights of all, of all restraining both the executive and the legislative branches where necessary to uphold constitutional, statutory, and international guarantees. They must afford redress in case, cases where rights have been violated and hold accountable those who are responsible. The OAS adopted, adopted the landmark Democratic Charter, which emphasizes improving the process of democracy and the functioning of democratic institutions through strengthening human rights and the rule of law. It seems clear that democracy and the rule of law emerge from the universal system for the protection of human rights, but they are also necessary for that system to operate. The relationship <clears throat> is thus one of interdependence, creating an inextricable web of basic and universal norms values and institutions along international alongside international mechanisms to promote and protect them the problems of abuse power poverty discrimination corruption and repression contain uh, continue but the fact remains that the triad of democracy human rights and the rule of law is the best des design thus far to emerge from human ingenuity. As Winston, Church Winston Churchill observed, democracy is the worst of all systems except for all the rest. Among the challenges we face now, you're all familiar with the phrase due process. The question comes up now, what does due diligence mean? Because the Inter-American Court has enunciated since its very first case, that due diligence is standard of care, which is to be applied in economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. <clears throat> and that, that means, as the um, Itlos Court, the Law of the Sea Tribunal, explained, uh, this means, this is a variable concept changing over time in light of the risks involved and the scientific or technical knowledge concerning those risks. A reasonable standard of care must be exercised, particularly in the environmental field. I don't have time to go through the 47-page observations I made um, for the climate change um, advisory opinion that the Inter-American Court is going to hold hearings on next week. But one of the questions they're going to be addressing is what are the state obligations in the context of the con climate emergency? There are probably 70 NGOs who are going to testify, as well as a dozen states and individuals who are also coming to Barbados not a bad place to go for the hearing. Um, I will be testifying, and as I said, I've got this very lengthy contribution that I will be trying to summarize in the seven minutes I'm allocated for it. Um, but 
The question is really one of what due diligence is required. Another question that I will throw out is, and it, this was discussed at a panel last week at the, Inter, at the Inter, American Society of International Law annual meeting. Who speaks for nature or its components? If rivers have rights and animals have rights, who speaks for them since they can't speak for themselves? Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a question that was debated in the panel. And Ecuador has taken one set of measures on it, which are mimicked in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, which have recognized rights for rivers and rights for other bodies of water. I'll be, leave it at that. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Diana. And we could have continued listening to you for the next hour. It, it's always being, it's always a pleasure to hear her because it's like being in a class. She's an authority on these issues. And I just want to say that that I really appreciated her remarks, not only because she reminded us, of course of that connection between democracy, rule of law, and human rights, but also the values behind human rights, you know, these values that we're always aspiring to when it comes uh, to human rights, freedom, justice, peace, human dignity, equity, and others, and also all the lingering questions, right, that we have um, in the context of the climate emergency, especially con concerning due diligence, you know, rights of nature, and others as well. So thank you, Diana, for that. And now I pass the microphone to Joaquin. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Rosa. First of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to GW, um, the OES. Uh, and it's truly an honor uh, to be part of this, this um, panel. I want to thank uh, Professor Shelton, Rosa, Ambassador Mora, Liliana, um, and the uh, um, rapporteur, uh, Mr. Palumo, as well. Um, and I would like to also start by commending um, the voluntary group led by uh, the United States to its mission uh, to the OAS, um, because it's such an important thing to involve civil society in these discussions. Um, and working with civil society organizations throughout the hemisphere, I am I'm truly um, honored for the opportunity to share some insights from the perspective of this sector that is so important to democratic um, well-being of, of countries and, and the region and the world as a whole. Um, I'll start by uh, sharing some insights about the connection between democracy and human rights. Um, I think um, we have masterfully heard from, from true experts in the field, so I'm going to cut right to some additional points that I wanted to illustrate um, based on some uh, developments and discourses that we've seen lately throughout the region. And um, it is very important to stress that democracy or human rights are interconnected and are not interconnected only to the extent of the rights that are um, based on individual freedoms or civil liberties. I think democracy is, as, as Professor um, Sheldon said, is, is the best able system to deliver for citizens, even at the socioeconomic level. I think there's this misconception that <clears throat> the democratic institutions are effective at protecting individual freedoms and political liberties, but there's vast amounts of literature, including from very reputed uh, institutions and studies such as the Variables of Democracy Project that show that historically democracy has um, done far better to deliver well-being to its citizens, including in socioeconomic aspects such as education, environmental protection, and many others, including GDP per capita. So um, <clears throat> sometimes authoritarian and anti-democratic regimes um, try to position that in order to fulfill the promises that they've made to its citizens, be that security or um, food or housing, you must at some point hamper um, into individual freedoms and rights to 
push your agenda forward. That is a, a false dichotomy that we think that it is very important to, to counter. Um, I think it's, in, it's critical to counter that narrative uh, that some rights need to be sacrificed in order to pursue others. Um, and I think it's the, the job not only of member states, but also civil society and citizens in general to counter this narrative. The Inter-American Democratic Charter is a, is a critical document in the sense that it truly reflects this concept of the indivisibility of human rights. It's not an either or, it's an yes and. I think states have the, the, the obligation to protect freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, to the same extent that they have to deliver material well-being to their citizens, protect their environment, and provide safety and security for them. Um, the Inter-American Charter specifically mentions not only these set of rights that are more um, to the states, for the states to protect, but also to, for the states to provide. And that is, I think, what makes it um, very unique compared to other international instruments at the American and the universal level. Um, however, we are seeing challenges uh, throughout the region and the globe regarding democratic institutions. I think it's no secret that we're seeing uh, challenges in the crisis of democracy, rule of law, protection of human rights, and the environment, as, as Liliana um, explained as well. And these are all interrelated. And I think it, there are some challenges that um, we've observed uh, through our work at, throughout the hemisphere, and I'll divide them into, I think, three sets of challenges. I think at the policy level, <coughs> um, excuse me, the weakness of some frameworks to protect freedom of association, of expression or, or assembly, and attempts by um, certain authoritarian regimes to justify the erosion of those um, principles on grounds such as national security, it not only undermines individual freedom, but also trust in democracy. And I think it deviates the attention to people and from the importance of rule of law, checks and balances, and other aspects of democracy that are not only free and fair elections, and gives way for authoritarian regimes to um, adopt a discourse that only a certain political group or individual is able to solve um, the problems of citizens and therefore deserves uh, absolute power. And I think that's the biggest risk facing our region and the globe in terms of democracy currently. At the discourse, discourse level, and very intricately related to what I just mentioned, there's um, a worrying trend of attacks to civil society organizations for performing their legitimate, watch, legitimate watchdog functions, and often arguing that they have, haven't won elections, which is a very dangerous um, argument to make, because um, it's important to remember that the civil society is not there to promote or, or, I guess, represent the rights of a majority. It's, it's specifically there to protect the rights of minorities. I think it's very important to remember that, as, as it's been said here right now, um, democracy that doesn't only require free and fair elections, it also requires checks and balances, and it also requires active efforts by states to promote equality and to promote minority rights, even when that goes against uh, the will of the majority, because there needs to be rule of law, institutions, accountability, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when governments and leaders, political leaders, question the legitimacy of civil society, it is very worrying because it's, a, a, I guess, a canary in the coal mine for other authoritarian instincts that might materialize in a, in a society. Finally, in terms of specific um, examples of attacks to democracy and human rights that we've seen, um, I think there's uh, a lot of cases of um, attacks to journalists, for example, in the region, some of them that have had to flee their own countries, either because of prosecution by their national government or sometimes by threats from organized crime, et cetera, et cetera. There's examples throughout the region, Central America, South America, you name it. Um, Liliana already mentioned um, a lot of this, but uh, environmental degradation is something that has um, compounding effects on human rights and on democratic stability. Um, I think it's 
um, it's concerning how we're seeing a lot of um, interrelated phenomena, for example, deforestation, um, wildlife trafficking, um, illegal mining, and all those illicit activities that are closely related to organized crime and to corruption, and it feeds in its own cycle and end up affecting the most vulnerable populations, undermining the rule of law, undermining um, judicial systems as we've seen throughout the region. Um, so all these challenges we can see are very much interrelated. And finally, um, most importantly, I think, um, as a phenomenon that cuts across all of these issues is uh, the issue of corruption. Corruption in all its forms undermines any effort aimed at promoting democracy and development as a whole. Um, and it's important that it's countered not only at the discourse level and not only at the level that well, I call uh, criminal populism or in Spanish populismo penal, um, which sometimes reduces the fight against corruption to a discourse aimed at persecuting your political foes. And I think very, very few politicians are legitimately in the camp of actually preventing corruption. And I think it's very important that citizens demand that. That it's not only I'm going to jail this person because he's corrupt, ambiguously defined. It's what am I going to do to foster a culture of transparency and to prevent corruption. And that's rare. So I think as citizens, we have the obligation to um, counter that narrative. And finally, um, how can we address all these issues um, in coalition between national governments, academic institutions, civil society? I think there are a few um, strategies that I can think of. Um, first of all, I think engaging civil society is a massive and incredible first step of doing this. And then again, I want to commend the, the voluntary group for this because it's a rare opportunity for um, those of us who work, I would say, on the, on the demand side of, of um, requesting or, or demanding democracy and the fight against corruption, et cetera, and the ones that are um, fulfilling the role of watchdogs or, or at least facilitating the roles of watchdogs to be incorporated into these discussions, even if it makes countries uncomfortable, because that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> Um, so I think that was, that's, that's the one thing that I will say, engaging constructively with civil society and understanding and recognizing its legitimacy in the democratic system is paramount. Promoting exclusive spaces, um, I think, as, as, as Liliana also said and others have said, it's important to not only engage international organizations such as PADF, <laughs> but also those that are at the forefront of the defense of human rights or the environment. Um, coincidentally, I just came back from, from the Amazon in Ecuador and Peru, and, and truly, it is there where people are defending their own rights at the forefront. Um, an incredible partner that we have in the Peruvian Amazon is currently engaged in an advocacy and awareness raising effort against two companies, one publicly owned and one privately owned, that are indiscriminately affecting their rights through pollu pollution, noise pollution, and they're um, threatening them, and these people rarely see the fruits, not only of democracy in their own countries, but of democratic, uh, excuse me, but of democratic uh, de international development cooperation as well. I think it's very important to recognize that we need to decolonialize international development and international aid. Um, this is probably a little bit um, beside the, the topic that brings us here today, but um, it's very important that we go beyond the, um, uh, or at least question the level to which um, we need to have civil society partners in the hemisphere that can masterfully implement millions of dollars in international aid. Sometimes the people that are most connected with the issues that are most prob problematic need help right away and need aid that, is, that has no strings attached um, and that goes directly to solving the problems that they have. Also, it's important to know that these organizations or these groups or these activists really truly are the people who know what the solutions to their day-to-day -day problems are. So I think it's truly important to listen to these grassroots organizations and these people that are fighting not only for their own rights, but to protect the Amazon, which is a global public good. 
Um, and finally, I think it's very important to collaborate between civil society and national governments to identify and promote best practices to, to build upon them and um, build better democratic systems. And I think as watchdogs institutions, civil society has a massive amount of insight on what needs to improve to make political processes and democratic, democratic processes more fair. And just to mention a couple of examples, um, as, as Professor Shelton mentioned, um, the judiciary plays a fundamental role in all democratic institutions. And the way that the judiciary is composed, the, not only um, the way it is designed as an independent institution, but also the way that the people that um, take part on those systems and that become judges and magistrates, etc., are selected appropriately without political interference and through processes that are fair. I think that's paramount. And there's a, a, a great deal of best practices that civil society organizations have um, um, identified throughout the region that um, I know that civil society is very keen on sharing those and promoting those in alliance with national governments. Um, and I think it's um, truly our job as civil society, as an international system, to promote that collaboration to identify and promote these best practices. Um, so again, I wanted to, to thank um, the organizers for this event. Uh, I think it's um, a rare opportunity to be able to share our views from a, um, from a perspective of civil society. And um, we are always willing to engage academic institutions, national governments to um, promote the well-being of, of our region. So thank you very much. And I yield the floor to you, Rosa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joaquin. And I think that's actually a wonderful conclusion you know, to go around the speaker presentations that we've had. And I just want to highlight a few things that Joaquin said that I think are critical. You know, He really highlighted the role of democracy you know, as a system that can deliver effective or at least can advance the well-being you know, of its citizens, more so than other systems. Also, the visibility of human rights, which is very important and is challenge in the atmosphere in many ways, and also the important role of civil society and also the concerning situation of civil society and challenges that do need uh, to be addressed promptly. So thank you so much for that. And I believe we can now open you know, the floor for dialogue, for questions, for comments. Um, just before we do that, Rosa, I was um, remiss. I, I want to make sure that I recognize the members of the voluntary group that are here. I want to thank member states who are here. I, I don't want to miss anybody, but I do see the Chilean ambassador. Uh, but I know there are others here from Brazil, Canada, Peru. So thank you all, et cetera. I, I'm sorry if I can't see you. But thank you all for, for being here and participating. It's Colombia. I saw Colombia, yes. I'm sorry. Mexico. Where's Mexico? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Um, thank you all for being here. So now we open the floor for comments, for questions, for dialogue. Bolivia. Again, this is not the best way of identifying people, <laughs> as it is much easier at the OAS. But again, my one, my apologies to thank you very much for being. A special welcome, actually, to all the ambassadors and OAS officials that are here. I also see representatives from several civil society organizations here as well. So welcome to and the our secretariat. Yes, yes. I see Paulina's here. Paulina Corominas is here. Again. Yes. <laughs> Any comments? It's usually not this quiet. <laughs> I have a, a, a question uh, just to maybe start off. Um, and so this was highlighted by, by Joaquin, but I think it's in all the presentations, right? And it's the question of uh, performance, democratic performance, or delivering, uh, if you will. And uh, the sacrifice that sometimes citizens make uh, or the deal that they make uh, in behalf of so usually in the polling data that you see, um, it, it, it usually is about performance. 
right? That's the issue that comes up, that, that democracy is, I don't see its relevance on my daily life, that it's not addressing my immediate concerns, whether those are material security, um, et cetera. And you know, historically, you know, when, when that occurs, uh, there's almost an inverse relationship with the rule of law, right? Um, now, obviously, the answer is, well, deliver, uh, perform better. Uh, that's sometimes easier said than done. But is there a way to think about situations like that when people are losing confidence and faith in democratic governance and institutions, the rule of law, where you know where this is going, is there a way or tools that are available that you can say, hey, wait a second, slow this down, um, remember uh, that it's a terrible bargain that you're trying to make here? It, or is it just inevitable that once democracies start going down that cycle, there's nothing we can do to stop that decline and we just have to wait for the next cycle? I think <clears throat> civic education programs are essential and they can help stem the tide in some respects and also judicial education. The judges need to be educated as well as the public. So I just think civic education all the way around is very important. That's one of the axes, actually. Right? <laughs> um, but yes, thank you. Um, I'll start by saying that the fight for democracy is never over. Um, and having been in this field for over a decade, um, I, can, I can tell you that as soon as you think that you have um, had impact, not only as an individual organization, but as civil society as a whole in um, guiding a specific country towards an improved democratic system, there's always going to be a curveball thrown at you at some point in the future. And that's a reason not to let our arms down ever. Um, having said that, I think it is not a lost battle. Um, and I'll cite two examples, one more recent and one that um, probably has about a decade. Guatemala, we, we saw that at the forefront of preserving the integrity of the Guatemalan election a few months ago was a civil society organization, a grassroots grouping of um, people throughout the country, often um, indigenous populations, that they were the ones physically putting them, their lives on the line to preserve the integrity of Guatemalan um, democracy and, and the Guatemalan election. So I think, again, the role of grassroots civil society organizations can play a key role in stopping uh, not only authoritarian regimes represented by one individual or one political group, but this corrupt elitist system that was undermining Guatemalan democracy. And that, it, again, it's not over. This is just, as, as, as I'm going to cite uh, mid 20th century leaders again, but it's not the beginning of the end, but maybe the end of the beginning. Um, that's one example. The other example, I think, when people truly, people can fed up. I think people can get fed up. I think leaders sometimes don't give citizens the credit they deserve. I myself, I'm an Ecuadorian national. Um, I was still, um, well, no, I was not in Ecuador. But I was uh, very much involved um, in with civil society when there was a, a nascent democratic transition, um, a citizen participation council that attempted to deconstruct the authoritarian system that had been built over the past few years. Now we're seeing new risks, um, but I think that also shows that when citizens get fed up, they can also organize themselves and stop this trend. Um, but again, I think the conclusion is that you're never done fighting for democracy. And that's why the role of civil society is so critical. I would agree. And I'll just like a slightly older um, situation, not from the Western Hemisphere, <clears throat> but it reflects the fact that international pressure can also have an impact. I had the honor of meeting Nelson Mandela a few years ago 
after he had spent 27 years in prison fighting for democracy in South Africa. The international pressure that was placed on South Africa together with grassroots society really succeeded in changing that society. So how could the OAS do that? Well, the OAS could the OAS could do that if your group comes out with specific recommendations <laughs> that states are willing to implement. I will also say that nominating good judges and good commissioners is critical. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have good commissioners and good judges in the Inter-American Court, the cases are not going to go well, and individuals will not get their rights respected. And if I may, I think one thing that we've learned over the years is the importance of participation and spaces to do so. And we keep on coming back to this. You know, the reality is that when you're working with any groups, you know, that have a history of marginalization or a history of human rights violations, and, and by that I mean women, indigenous peoples, LGBTIQ plus groups and others, you know, at the end of the day, consistent participation and having spaces at the national level and at the international level and at the local levels to do this so that they feel they have a certain buy-in, a certain influence in legislation and policies and programs, um, it, it has proven to be um, an alternative that we should be pursuing more and more. And I think we have some examples in the region that we can expand, but I think we need to expand uh, more than we have. And I think we need to be talking directly with these groups more often as well. Mm. Um, I think that's part of the issue as well. I think what King was alluding to this as well, that at the end of the day, um, a lot of it is making sure that we have consistent participation, consistent listening to these voices, and also changing course if we need to change course as well. And that's where you start building trust, right, at the end of the day. And I do agree with what Joaquin said, that I think there's a lot of trust problems with our democracies. Um, I will just add that publicity from the OAS could really help because it's very complicated Which now publicity? with all the so so publicity? publicity. Like there was an article in the paper a week ago about a woman who won their case at the Inter-American Human Rights Court, and she came and she got the Guatemalan government to come here and issue a public apology to it. Nowhere in the article was the OAS mentioned. It was all just, they interviewed NGOs, they interviewed the mother of Rosa Franco, that was the applicant, and I was on the commission when the case was there. They didn't interview me, and they didn't talk to anybody on the commission or the court, and I think that's a, an overlooked chance to educate people. I come back to education, but issuing more than just the standard press releases at the end of each session, if there was some way you could, and I know it's complicated with social media today, but I really miss reading about the OAS in local newspapers. And I know it's not the same in other countries. We're particularly bad at it here. Hi there, thank you. I'd like to thank the whole panel. I'm Jillian Gillen from the Canadian Mission to the OAS. And um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Ambassador Mora for the initiative of this event today. And uh, there's so much that I could ask about. I think the first thing that comes to mind is 
Um, particularly for you, Professor, you mentioned that there was this event um, maybe last week or recently where there are a few questions that were left hanging for consideration. And now with a bit more time, if you have the space to elaborate a little bit where you said that there were these questions around due diligence and what's required and particularly the issue around who speaks for nature and thinking about the charter and its indivisibility of rights and uh, you know, rights for the environment and now quite particularly for animals. And we see the challenges of dealing with the indivisibility of rights as it relates to humans. But again, this will be an enriching complexity to uh, our considerations around this. And so wondering if the panelists here could expand thoughts on that specifically. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for that question, which is very provocative. Uh, let me start with due diligence and what that means and what it requires. The Inter-American Court has already said that envir the environment needs to be protected because degradation of the environment and climate change negatively impact all human rights. And so the states have an obligation positive obligation to exercise due diligence. What does that mean? That means they must take preventive measures within their jurisdiction, and jurisdiction is divide, defined very broadly to include um, anything that is under your um, control. So corporations, the state sending the corporation has duties of due diligence as well as a receiving state to take all reasonable measures that they can to prevent further climate change. And <clears throat> um, environmental impact assessments have been said to be an obligation here. Those need to be conducted independently and fairly with the participation of all potentially affected persons. So that's on the due diligence side. On the rights of nature and who speaks for nature, in the Western Hemisphere, many, in, many indigenous tribes have still got land claims. And through the land claims, if they are respected, they get their land and territories back. And they can then speak on behalf of everybody in the community that's potentially affected by any environmental um, consequences that happen. Loroyo case was just decided recently in that respect, giving the people in the Oriente region of Ecuador um, significant <coughs> rights protections. So I think in some cases it's going to be indigenous communities, but in other cases, it will be those litigating against the indigenous communities, those that don't respect the environment, and there are some. Um, I would like to see a, a public interest law that says ev everybody has the right to bring an action, either at the legislature or the courts, on behalf of the environment or its components. Do you want to say something? Yeah, um, absolutely agree. And I think um, <clears throat> on the first aspect um, of due diligence, I think it's a prerequisite for due diligence to work is a very strong judiciary, not only at the country level, but at the American court, for example. But that is, that is very critical. And it's even better if interests are aligned. Um, which brings me to the answer to the second question, which I completely agree with uh, Professor Shelton, which is we already have the stakeholders speaking up for nature in the form of indigenous peoples throughout the hemisphere. I just came back from Ecuador and Peruvian Amazon, and they're there. They just need their voices to be heard. And I think it's our job to do it as international civil society organizations, as um, representatives of countries to international bodies, et cetera. Um, there's obviously uh, a gap, 
Um, I think not every valuable ecosystem has an advocate that because its degradation affects them directly will advocate for the well-being of that natural resource or that natural ecosystem. That's where due diligence comes in, but that's also where civil society again <laughs> comes in. Um, so I think it's very important to listen to the voices um, of people that are being materially affected by this degradation and that have shown to be the most effective stewards of nature in the form of indigenous populations, specifically in the Amazon and elsewhere. In the case, for example, of oceans, which, I mean, it hasn't been mentioned as, as, as exhaustively here, but we have a huge crisis in the ocean in the form of the effects of climate change, ocean acidification, loss of fish stocks, etc. So, for example, um, better international instruments to enforce, for example, sustainable fishing practices are paramount need. Um, and working with stakeholders such as artisanal fishers that sometimes can see the effects of better natural resource management pretty quickly. And then they go from being an opposing party in the preservation of an ecosystem to a critical ally. And that again goes to education, which what the professor said before. I think it's important to help all stakeholders understand what is that we're aiming for, but for that we need first to trust or we need to gain the trust of citizens to know that national governments, states are listening to its citizens and are able to resolve their problems. Um, and I think for this, it's I've noticed a, a, a paradigm shift in recent months even about the need to not only as international development aid invest in the, when we're talking about democracy and governance, in institutional design, in promoting reforms that uh, help uh, foster judicial independence and checks and balances and freedom of expression or passing lots of laws. We need people-centered justice. We need judicial system not only to be independent, but also to be effective and efficient and to resolve the problems of, of people that really need it at the most basic level. And only then we can talk about a sustainable, true, trust in democratic institutions. I would just like to come back to the issue of <clears throat> due diligence in the corporate sector. Um, when we went to Panama to make an on-site visit, a Canadian hydroelectric project was in, in question. <clears throat> and it didn't split the indigenous community because they were offered jobs at the hydroelectric plant, and they were offered a new state-of-the-art gymnasium and soccer field. So many people thought this was a great deal and they should just take it. The more traditional indigenous didn't want anything to do with that. So we had to negotiate among the various groups. And it was really hard, and Canada has some responsibility toward all the indigenous who are impacted by its corporations that are going and destroying the environment. I also um, wanted to say something about the, the formal recognition of rights of nature, um, obviously, I'm an Ecuadorian national, I've seen it uh, since 2008 when the rights of nature were enshrined in the Constitution. But ever since, what have we seen? Um, we've seen dubious ways to justify the exploitation of very sensitive areas in the Amazon, in the Yasuni, by redrawing maps and basically in a desk, changing, redrawing the map so that the the drilling wells are outside the territories of indig uncontacted indigenous populations. We've seen um, mining licenses that have been awarded without due process. So beyond recognizing nature's rights, I think it's important to actually enforce them. Um, and, and I think that strong democratic institutions and judiciary transparency and the rule of law are the only way to to achieve that. Um, and I actually have one question, <laughs> um, Professor uh, Shelton. I think there's a very interesting dynamic happening uh, in terms of 
well, ILO 169 and the right to free prayer and informed consent versus um, direct democratic instruments. And, and I say this because last year there was a referendum in Ecuador asking whether or not people wanted to um, stop drilling in, in the Yasuni National Park in the Amazon. And this was an interesting historical, um, I guess, giving back the rights that the Yasunidos movement had lost because they had prevented them to do the referendum in 2013 when they were actually in time to do it, et cetera, et cetera. But interestingly, in the provinces where the drilling was taking place, the referendum lost, even though it, it won um, everywhere else. And to me, that's telling. And it's also a concerning precedent because I imagine a future in which there's another sensitive extractive industry discovery in a very sensitive area, and they, the gov a government decides to ask not the communities directly affected by that project, but the country as a whole. <laughs> and what if that decision, what if the country says majority, or, or the majority of the country votes, yes, let's uh, pursue this mining project, and the local communities are against it? Like, is that a dangerous precedent uh, to have? It totally is a dangerous precedent, and I think that's a violation of ILO 169 because you're supposed to have prior informed information and consent by those directly affected. Not everybody in the country is directly affected. So I think that also violates both um, UNDRIP and also the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I don't know how to remedy that other than saying yeah. that's an invalid referendum. challenges of um, uh, transnational organized crime mm -hmm. to our democracies and to our government and also to our civil society. I, I, I know that this question is on the line of, um, um, of the, this uh, uh, panel today, but I, think it's I would like to know your thoughts about that. Serious Well, there was an interesting article on the front page of the Washington Post today about how Haiti is getting all of its arms from the United States. And it's organized crime is destabilizing democracies throughout the hemisphere. Haiti is now a basket case because of the situation there. And um, so I really think there's something that needs to be done in terms of combating organized crime as a threat, not only to human rights, but to democracy and certainly to the rule of law. But, but if I can just build on that question, just to add, I, I think the key part to Anna's question is that these organizations are so powerful and so wealthy that they are penetrating right? uh, legislatures, judiciaries, and so forth, right? without having to use intimidation or coercion or uh, th th just the, the level of penetration. And so you don't have institutions to push back right. on the on authoritarianism as it moves along. That's a, that's a significant challenge. It is. It's a great challenge. And I don't know that I have any answers to that <laughs> other than making use of um, the, not just the electoral process, impeachment process to get rid of the individuals that you can identify as being corrupt. But, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, it, it, I'm not gonna mention any country. <laughs> I can't. Uh, 
a ver, eh, well, the but, but the point here is that politicians responsible for impeachment are politicians that often are bought by criminal organizations right, right. and that are serving the interests of criminal yeah. organizations. So there is no political or juridical mechanism right. for accountability. That's right. I think it, it's, it's incredibly challenging and it's very much related to the topic of this panel because the link between corruption and organized crime is, is, is a marriage made in heaven. And um, I don't know how many of you follow Ecuadorian developments, but in the past couple of months, there's been three probes, we are, and counting, <laughs> uh, to try and dismantle the incredibly deep um, penetration of organized crime in Ecuador's judicial institutions from the top. I mean, the provincial court of Guayas, I think nine of the 15 judges are in jail right now. Um, judges from the National Court of Justice, the head of the judicial, the Judiciary Council, um, private lawyers, prosecutors, policemen, jail directors, prison guards, you name it. It's a huge probe. And it takes, in this case, a brave AG <laughs> in the form of Diana Salazar in Ecuador with the backing of political sectors that for one reason or other reason are interested in dismantling this system, and most importantly, of the international community. And there I will commend the State Department, which has really thrown its, um, like its backing to the efforts by Diana Salazar to really dismantle this system. Um, so I think that's, that's very important because it's pervasive and it affects, it erodes uh, democratic institutions, it affects human rights. I think it's very important also to remind citizens that corruption is not only something that happens in the high spheres of governments, but that corruption kills. If a hospital was built with a um, dodgy procurement process and then it falls down in an earthquake, that's corruption. So I think it's very important to, 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 to understand that and to understand the link between that and organized crime and the way to counter it. There's many, I think civil society, as I mentioned, is one, but also having champions of democracy that are willing to put their life, honestly, on the line to, to recover um, democratic institutions from organized criminal organizations. I just wanted to add that thank you so much for bringing that to the table because I do think that that's one of the larger problems, right, that we have in the Americas and it's actually quite complex to address. One thing that we're seeing in human rights today, especially in human rights law, is that we have all these modern issues, right, that are not necessarily centered on the state. They involve all these non-state actors, right? And we're still cracked in that framework. How do we respond? And what I mean by legal framework is not just what are the legal obligations under specific instruments, but what are the standards of state behavior when it comes to these particular problems, right? And I do think organized crime is one of the ones where the OAS can have a very important role in setting what the standards of state behavior are, especially to preserve democracies, to combat corruption, to combat all these problems. The law only gives you part of the answer, you know? And we are seeing a lot of human rights problems like that today. Um, everything digital, for example. You know, for me, that's part law, part standards of state behavior, part standards of also, what are we gonna tell non-state actors they should be doing or not be doing when it comes to human rights? And it's interesting, we have some examples at the United Nations of this. We have the UN Rules and Principles, et cetera. And of course, all these standards of, of state behavior have mixed results, but some of them have very interesting practices of implementation at the national level, especially when you reach beyond the state, right? But I do think a big challenge that we have in human rights is figuring out how to address the modern in a way that reconciles what we need legally, but also what we need governments to do, right? To advance democracy and to advance human rights. And I think that's one of the issues that we're having the most struggles with. And it's not the only one, unfortunately. There's many issues, like organized crime, that at the end of the day, you need a multifaceted strategy. And I do think the OAS, for me, one of the biggest values of the OAS is all these governments and all these civil society organizations dialoguing about these issues, you know, setting standards, defining what 
What should we do when it comes to a specific issue? And that has an enorm enormous value, especially when you start spreading other regions in the world. Other regions don't have this, you know, what we have in the Americas. So it's something to value. I think it's a ray of hope, right? You know, that the OAS does have an entry point here. It's just a question of strategizing and figuring out exactly, you know, what we need to say about these issues. I would just <clears throat> add that I agree totally with my co-panelists who talked about the need for individuals to step up to the plate and put their lives on the line to fight corruption. Uh, but civil society could play a role in getting behind these individuals. On the international level, Guatemala was a case also uh, where the prosecutor, she had to flee the country eventually, but she really battled to the end of her tenure there against the corruption in the government. Um, and so civil society organizations from outside the region could really help to support her in her work, as well as the OAS. question off of that point, and I will address it initially to Joaquin, actually, because we raised this in our discussion, um, but thanks, Laura, you elaborated on it a little bit, and anyone else who would like to join us this morning, welcome. Uh, Joaquin, you stressed the importance of creating spaces for these CSOs and grassroots organizations and other interested parties, but mostly CSOs, to have this dialogue and share concerns and best practices, and um, I'm curious to know what you think the challenges are in terms of space is up, and what we can yeah. Absolutely, and um, trust me, I, I, I live those challenges every day because they're, they're, they relate to the need for accountability. And I'll mention, I'll focus on one specific, and it's the need for accountability in um, anything that has to do with taxpayer money. Um, international development aid, especially, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about US-led aid, US State, uh, USA, the State Department, you name it, um, for very good reasons, um, there needs to be accountability in terms of where that money is going. And as an international represented an international NGO, I can tell you that it's no easy feat. It requires a lot of bureaucracy, requires a lot of organizational capacity to be able to not only raise, but also implement uh, funds coming from international development. And that's not only expensive, it's incredibly difficult for uh, organizations at the forefront of, of this fight. So I'll give you a couple of examples of ways that I think are, are um, interesting strategies to gather the, the voices or to amplify the voices of such um, uh, communities and grassroots organizations. One is to actually correct the system from within. Um, and an example is, for example, we have a project um, in the region that uh, it's funded by uh, the State Department and its aim is to democratize civil society. We provide um, organizational capacity building um, and, uh, well, technical capacity building and small grants to grassroots organizations. I mean, our, our motto is we need to go to where international cooperation doesn't go. Um, the, the catchphrase that we used was um, to vamos a ir donde no llega ni la Navidad, where not even Christmas uh, gets or reaches, and actively go and help these people incorporate those systems so they can themselves eventually uh, raise funds from international development and they themselves can implement their own projects and basically cut the middleman. I'm driving myself out of a job, but I think it's a good thing. Uh, that's the one thing. And the other thing is leveraging um, public money and, and, and government um, influence to attract private sector money that can much more easily be no strings attached. And I think there's a couple of prominent examples. There's Mackenzie Scott, there's Leonardo DiCaprio, who are basically adopting that as their strategy and they're cutting the middlemen and going directly to the communities and the organizations that most need it and providing 
resources with no strings attached. We recognize that it's impossible to do that with taxpayers' money, but it's, it's possible to leverage the power of national governments to attract that money. And those are two strategies uh, to actually help channel the resources to the communities most in need that I can think of. But it's also a matter of having independent and free media in these countries and strong civil societies within these countries because that job can be risky. So I think it's very important to protect those individuals at the same time. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, Rosa. I'm Andrea Cohn, and I work at the Colonia Mission of the Colonia Tudor Organization of American States. I have to say thank you for uh, the. No, it's true. Okay. <laughs> I suspect it's not on. That's why I changed my. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Andrea Larcón and I work at the Mission of Colombia to the Organization of American States. Um, I have to say thank you for um, convoke this, this event because for us it's very important this subject. Um, we, we, I, we, I am I'm working with the working group and trying to figure out can, how can we advance in those issues. Our mandate is very specific and sometimes it's very difficult to figure out how to advance it. Um, but I think uh, with all the information that we have and the discussion that we address today, we have a lot of elements. It still is difficult, uh, but I think uh, I just want to underline that for, uh, for my, my perspective, uh, it's important, the, the last uh, thing that you were mentioned about the individuals, we need to empower the individuals and also to um, make them feel um, up on, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't find the word, to um, increase the conscious about the importance of democracy. Because democracy is everywhere. It's, uh, it's there when you are worried about corruption, when you're worried about if your government is involved in some illegal activities, if the judicial system is also working for illegal groups or something. But it's also involved uh, uh, when the, uh, the people, the, ind the indigenous people, the Afro-descendant people, is trying to uh, reach the government to ask for uh, environmental justice. And they also need uh, to be uh, heard and also the due diligence with the companies. But how can we uh, put everything together and try to work? I think education. But also from the organization, we need to do this uh, kind of debates that we are doing right now and try to also uh, help people to understand their responsibilities because it's not only about governments or institutions. We need people to empower about their democracies and defend it. Uh, because what we need is more democracy, more human rights, more respect, and more, more environmental justice. But it's also on our responsibility as individuals Governments, academy, uh, everyone, every, everybody. But uh, still, I, I want to invite the panel. If after this discussion you have another ideas for the group, concrete ideas that we can advance, is I think is good for us. And I hope I'm, I'm speaking in the name of everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for all the, like when I say, lessons that we had today was really insightful, all this panel. I'm from Brazil, I'm a LLM student here, and I'm also an intern at the OES. So I would like to understand a little more from my Brazilian perspective. For example, we had a very recent attack to our democracy, like in the last few years, and we have our population completely divide. That's, it's not, I can say I, I only like 30 years, but I never saw this before in Brazil. So it's completely crazy how the, in the last few years we are increasing this kind of like division of the population, family, friends, etc. And I would like to understand from you, from your perspective, what do you believe that we could done to like aware this population that they need 
to join again to like strange our democracy because without democracy we can do nothing basically. So how you saw this division of the populations, not only like the civil society, the politicians and etc., but like the population per se. Um, if I may, very quickly, I, I think that's the million dollar question that I don't think no one can credibly say they know the answer to how to solve polarization. I think that's, that's kind of like what everyone is breaking their heads about right now. I will say that it goes um, to the core of like the trust that you have in institutions. And when that trust is eroded, that's what promotes or that what that's what creates this breeding ground for populism and for um, like divisionist politics and unfortunately I don't I don't have the answer to that um, but I think it, it goes to I think the key is is how to build trust and that's the question that we should be asking ourselves um, in terms of um, Empowering individuals at the, at the local level, uh, the president of Colombia, I think, uh, brought up a very interesting point, and, and, and I think it's important to work together in that sense. And I commend Colombia as well. Um, I was happy to read that Colombia and Brazil have reached uh, really significant results in, in reducing reforestation based on the most recent data through a number of strategies that may or may not be applicable in other countries in the region, but those are the sorts of best practices that could be shared among countries, leaving aside political differences, because I think especially the nine countries that have that share the Amazon have a duty to protect it. And I think that's something that does not need to be permeated by high politics and ideology. So I encourage further collaboration among um, not only Colombia and Brazil, but the other seven countries that share the Amazon to find those best practices. And as civil society organizations, I think we are very um, interested party um, and could potentially be a conduit to connect with the people on the ground to to understand the problems better and find the best uh, solutions. In terms of in individuals and getting them interested in democracy, the more you could focus on local issues that affect the people, the more participation you're likely to have. So for instance, if there's a school board, you need to get people involved in the school board. Um, local judges, everybody has, knows somebody who has been to court. So if you have a process for citizen participation in evaluating judges, that's another way to do it. Um, I'm gonna tell a war story. Uh, what, once I met Zenaida Velasquez, who brought the original case, the first case, to the Inter-American Court. Uh, and it came to the commission first. And when I met her, I said, Zenaida, how did you know to bring a case to the OAS? Because in Honduras, I didn't think it was very well known. She said, I knew nothing about the OAS, but the local NGO I went to did. So I think that bringing NGOs into the process and creating new ones, you know, get like-minded people together and file, and file your papers to create your own NGO. That's another way. Yeah, and I think it's, it's fascinating what you just said. I think uh, creating new NGOs and in increasing the diversity and representation of those NGOs to ensure that they actually represent those most in need. And I think one of the challenges that we face there is actually limits to how new NGOs can be created. And it's, it's difficult to address that issue because um, I'm going to bring Ecuador again because I know it best. <laughs> but in 2010 or 12, uh, there was a, a decree that was issued uh, to regulate civil society organizations that basically laid out very vague reasons for the government to be able to unilaterally shut down civil society organizations. In this pseudo-democratic transition that started in 2017, the decree was reformed. It's less bad 
but it still gives uh, discretion to the national government to shut down NGLs, and it's not a law. It's a decree, so it can be dismantled immediately or made worse by any incoming president. So I think it's very important to remember the freedom of association is also a right that's enshrined in several inter-American um, documents, in several universal human rights documents, and it's very important for citizens to demand that right of free association through uh, sound and solid institutional frameworks. And again, the devil is in the details in these things. Uh, I think it's very important to look closely what the provisions are, what the legal status of whatever law regulation um, deals with civil society are in a country and what the actual process is to, to register a new CSO. I mean, I think in most countries in the region, actually Brazil is a fairly good example of, of, of better standards on freedom of association than others, but in many countries in the region, one thing that we mentioned or that we laughed about <laughs> one time we went to Ecuador and talked to about a bunch of different stakeholders is that you can set up a political party in 48 hours, but it takes like five years to set up a new NGO. So I think improving those institutional frameworks around freedom of expression, around freedom of association is key to be able to actually create new NGOs that represent those most in need. Andrea, I just wanted to say in response to your question in terms of what the voluntary group can do, I think there needs to be a lot of education on the concept of democracy and the concept of human rights in itself. I mean, I remember when I worked at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, half of the work was making sure people knew what human rights were, what the, what the instruments were, how to use them. You know, the fact that this was also represented not only in international law and national laws, there was so much education to be done, especially when you go to local communities, to rural communities, to people that don't necessarily have the access, right, that we have. And I think with, the, with democracy, it's the same. You know, there's a lot of education to do as to what is, a demo what is considered a democracy, what are the parameters of a democracy, what makes a democracy strong, um, there's a lot of different conceptions of what a democracy should be, right? Um, and there's even a lot of different conceptions of human rights. But what we do know is that we do have standards that have already been you know, developed, accepted, that have the agreement of the regional community and also the international community. And all of that, we need to do more education around what we have already, what we already have consensus on, right? What we know is very important. Right? You know, we have an inter American democratic charter. There needs to be education on that, right? You know, um, and, and, and to make it in a way that reaches beyond, you know, those populations that are very connected, right? You know, to Washington, D.C. and international affairs and, and the world of OAS. We have to find a way to reach beyond that. And it's a challenge. I, I, it's not easy to do. Um, in human rights in general, um, you see different efforts. You know, but it's not easy to reach beyond, you know, those who have access, right? And at the end of the day, we want strong democracies, and we want that connection between democracy and human rights. You have to reach further, and I do think the voluntary group can work on that, right? On strategies to do that. <clears throat> Joaquin mentioned Ecuador, so I'll just add my war story from Ecuador. I was down there and giving a lecture to the ju judiciary in Guayaquil on what does it mean to have an independent and impartial judiciary. Half the judges walked out during my talk. <laughs> they didn't want to hear it. So I think educating the judiciary in different countries is very important, judicial education. I've seen so many programs in judicial education, and they're very, very effective when they're done right. So. Well, thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you all for, for being here. Stay tuned for more of this kind of engagement with GW and other civil societies. So thank you again. Uh, and Rosa, thank you so much for the collaboration. This is not the, the last one. Hopefully not. And to our panelists, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for us.